Hello and welcome to the next episode of The Prestige, a podcast about films, filmmaking and film theory. In each programme we'll focus on a particular movie that one of us has chosen for that week and we're going to review it and talk about it and discuss some of the ideas and themes that this film throws up. And as always we end our show with recommendations for films to watch following this week's show. So if you like what you saw this week, here's what to watch. If we didn't like it, here's what we thought was better. The links are going to be as, as tenuous or, or as close as we kind of desire or demand. My colleague on this podcast is Rob Maythorpe. Um, and I was thinking about this this evening. I reckon if he had a USP, it would probably be making things look good. Um, <laughs> which, which actually... Uh, I meant this is good. Yeah, see, that did remind me of my favourite line from Men in Black. So y- you've, <laughs> you've reminded me of, of Will Smith. Um, so... Is it making things look good now is photography and editing and design and publishing and baking stuff. And it used to be working on the visual effects side. Um, the movie industry, variety of films of all sizes and origins and budgets. And I am Sam Knowles. I'm a teacher, editor and writer, probably at the moment in that order. Um, on various genres like novels, poems, drama, comics, films, and on topics like race, history, politics, and asylum. I put here a note, end on an upbeat note. So, yeah, that's a great way to end. That's us. That is. And so, Sam, this week, uh, the film that we've watched has been your choice. It has indeed. So, this week, for Halloween, coming up this week, and you can commemorate that if you want to. That's something. That's your bag. Is that your bag? It's the sort of thing that Bad Club Comics said in the 70s. Jesus. Yeah. Yes. And anyway, so, Hall- Halloween. The movie you've chosen this week is the 2014 horror film, The Babadook. Where'd you get this? On the shelf. If it's in a word or it's in a look. You can't get rid of the Babadook. A rumbling sound, then three sharp knocks. That's when you'll know he's around. You'll see him if you look. Um, so Australian film. Um, Wookie says Australian-Canadian, but that's more to do with the production involved. Um, and it was a directorial debut of Australian actress and director Jennifer Kent. And there are two main characters, played by Essie Davis, who's a quite famous Australian TV and film actress. Although I've seen her in stuff before, and frankly she was unrecognisable in this. It surprised me that it was her. And the second character is Noah Wiseman, and they play a mother and a son who live alone as a result of a car accident when Amelia was on her way to the hospital to have her son Sam in which his father, her husband, Oscar, died. And it focuses on a roughly two-week period around Sam's seventh birthday, where he discovers a children's book, or what seems to be a children's book, and it becomes something of an obsession, and not just for him. Um, and that's probably about it in terms of setup. So, Rob, what did you think? Mm. About half an hour into this film, a, a thought struck me. Mm-hmm. And it's not a thought you often get in horror films, especially not of this kind of a... I wanted the two main characters to die. <laughs> I was actively wishing for their demise. Oh, you've got no soul. I uh, know. I genuinely hated both the characters <laughs> at that point. And okay. was wishing for, for whatever malevolent force the film brings about to deal damage to them right as the film progressed i think it got better i think towards the end i certainly felt for the child if not the mother Mm -hmm. i think that the effects unfortunately i felt fell between two camps because i think when it comes to horror films there's good effects 
and then there's bad effects and bad mm. effects can be good because you know they're bad mm. like if it's a terrible cheap horror film that's fine it's when there's somewhere between the two and you feel that it doesn't really work and I, I wasn't sold on a lot of the effects um, but the bottom line for me that undercut the entire thing is that I just hated the mother's character and I just wanted her to suffer right okay <laughs> I think it was a a well made film I think the scares were there the jumps were there and generally the sense of unease they had um, was was there I just unfortunately I would say I've seen it done better elsewhere mm-hmm. and I just hated her okay. your thoughts Sam well you, you, we said last week I said last week this was something completely outside my comfort zone I do not know anything about this genre at all so when you say you've seen it done better elsewhere what do you mean where do you mean in that oh well, well I mean where we'll probably cover another recommendation certainly but how oh, okay right um, the, I think the fact was that, from my point of view, we we, we live in a pretty in a horror world, in a, in this kind of home invasion slash slasher slash supernatural film. Mm. We've gone through the postmodern revolution in these films. We've had Scream, we've had that kind of self awareness. Mm. You know, we've had the, the the idea that they always run upstairs and they should run outside, that kind of thing. Yeah. And then you've got this woman who lives in this house where she never turns on any lights. You know, like it, it, the, the the film is set in a well. It's all about being dark at night, and she never turns on like everything's really dark. And you're like, in this world where we're living, this kind of the post horror world that we live in, put in media, mm. it just strikes you as like this is just stupid. Um, as an example, there's a film that came out last year as well called It Follows, right? Which kind of came out at a similar sort of time. It's about the idea that there's a sexually transmitted demon. That follows you. Mm. It will just slowly walk and it will follow you forever and then it will kill you. Yes. Yeah. And in that, you've got kids who are like, well, how do we fix this? How do we get around this? How do we stop this? And even when they can't, because it's a primordial force of nature, there's an ad- idea that they're going to do something about it, that they're aware of what's happening. Whereas this, I just felt, I didn't care for the carrying character. Mm. So, as so I say, at half an hour in, I wanted them to be hurt. <laughs> If you want me to care about this bad guy mm. and and how they deal with him, whether they deal with him in a kind of shooting him in the face way or placating or however they deal with that character, you've got to make me care about the people who are in trouble. Okay, yeah, that's good. And because I didn't care about this, and I understood what they were trying to do in they had the the balance of power and the balance of what I'd call the idea of within the film turn this later the idea of of a monster in the film is played with and you kind of the the idea of who the monster is in the film shifts Mm. in interesting ways um but it felt to me like an interesting idea they tried to do but it failed in being an entertaining film because i just didn't care about the characters i see right Um, what did you think so well, I have lots of positive things to say about the film, but looking at them, I can see that a lot of them are to do with it being a really good idea, and them do have done they have done something clever to bring about this. Um, mm. So I see what you're saying. I haven't got a lot about the characters necessarily. Um, oh, I think I, I, I'm a bit just in the past, but I think people can like films for any reason. Mm, yes, yeah. So I I very much like this film, but it was an intellectual liking rather than a sort of visceral personal liking. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciated what this film was doing, um, and I think one one of the things I particularly wanted to talk about this week. Um, I wasn't sure what we were going to discuss because, like I said, this comes from somewhere that I don't know much about. But it came out very clearly, certainly, at the end of this film and then throughout this film, I suppose, the idea of people being traumatised by experiences. Mm. Um, And the thing I really liked about this film, um, when compared with... I I don't know what, a a standard horror film? I don't know. It was the fact that there was a psychological motivation to what was going on. There was yes. a reason why she was like this, or Sam was like this, or the situation was like this. You have that shot right at the very beginning where she is reliving a traumatic experience. 
So mm -hmm. the very start of the film, you've got the idea that she is a traumatised person. And that's, that's something that I, I really appreciated about this film, the way it did that. But I can see what you're saying. It's it's kind of it's like um, I don't I haven't watched The Walking Dead, but I've heard people talk about The Walking Dead as, as brilliant, but also as um, I think it's something you mentioned before actually that it, it's a world in which people don't know about zombie films, and I can see mm. what you're saying. This is kind of the same thing. Like Amelia's living in a world where she doesn't know the tropes of a horror film. And yes. that can be a yes. bit grating, I suppose. I suppose, I mean, just listening to, you, to your review there, I suppose there is a an argument to be made that I was watching this as a horror film. Mm. And if I take it back from that and look at it as maybe more of a psychological drama, yeah, then it works a lot better. I mean, I mean that may be maybe another way to look at it, is that as a horror fan, as a horror fanboy that I am, and looking for a horror film, I didn't think it worked. But I do agree that the way it's handled the idea of trauma and grief mm. and making those things flesh in many ways, well, uh, with a given value of flesh, but making those things flesh in their world and the film being a much larger allegory for dealing with trauma and grief, mm. it works a lot better, I suppose. So I, I, will, I will give it that, that I think if you separate it out from being a, a sort of conjuring paranormal activity style horror film, Hmm. It probably works on better levels. I had a, a thought about this, sort of coming at the idea of appreciating horror films from the outside. It's not something I tend to do. I um, was thinking about where this word trauma comes from. Um, and trauma comes from talking about wounds. You have gunshot trauma as an example, but you have the, the word originally in Greek meant a physical wound. Um, so originally, I wondered if sort of fight or flight adrenaline response was to trauma, to being injured in some way. So mm -hmm. maybe is there something about horror films that people say, oh, I love horror films because of the adrenaline. I love the frights. I love being scared. But maybe there's something that, that they like being traumatised in a safe way. That's a weird way to put it, but it's like, it's like no, a no. release valve. I, I, I agree entirely. I think the films that... There are some films that we can all look at and go, you know what, that isn't a great film, but I like it because it gets a reaction. Mm. Infamously, Weepies. You know, the, 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 uh, the, those films that generally your mum watches that makes her cry. And you watch every engine, always make her cry, but you'll always watch it. Because it, re it sort of provokes that extreme reaction. I think horror is the same thing. Horror, I think, has got a like, slightly bigger fan base, at least a more vocal fan base. Mm. But I think that yeah, I think it's the fact that you can watch a film and when a film is good and when a horror film is a good horror film, it evokes feelings in that you, you that you can't get out of the way but are safe. Like like roller coasters. Mm. Like roller coasters are terrifying, but also in a way that genuinely you know they're kind of okay. Yes. Yeah. I mean yes, there are the obvious occasional accidents, but on the whole, you go into them thinking they're okay. And horror is the same. And generally and less so these days, there is a feeling of vanquishing. Mm. So you need, when you watch a horror film, you're on the idea that, you know, at the end of this, it's going to be okay, generally. Yeah. yeah. And, but I do th I think you're right. I think that that extreme reaction and that kind of cathartic trauma is certainly one of the allure of this kind of film. Mm. Yeah. I was trying to talk about some, something else that I really liked about this film, and Again, it's nothing to do with the characters, but just the way it looks, the way it was put together, the way... I mean, I don't... Well, certainly more since I've been talking to you recently, but I never used to think about the editing of a film too much. Mm. And this is one where I really did. I don't know whether that's because Tony Yu has trained me to do that or because it was so visual and striking. But it struck me that it was... It was put together in a really slick way. So whether it was yeah, the, and, the characters being introduced or the way they interacted, and I, I would say that uh, just to, to to echo that and build on that, from I mean, my experience obviously as a, as a colorist, but from a color point of view, it was very well done. Mm. That everything in their house was always kind of a muted color. Yeah, that everything was a greys or dark blues, and everything, and then 
not wishing to give any spoilers away, but scenes at the sister's house, scenes at the end of the film, whilst not being colourful, are still much brighter. I did really notice something. Um, and it was at the sister's house. Um, it was something about the, there was a, a, a bright colour palette. And then there's a scene in the kitchen with five women opposed to mm. Amelia. And those five women are all stood up and they're all in black. And it's a really, it's a really colourful scene behind them. It's a bright white kitchen scene behind them, but the five characters are really strikingly in black. And there was mm. something that was kind of echoing the the monstrous elements in this film, like that she was being sort of borne down on by these these strange black characters, even though they were having inane conversations about their daily lives. So I really enjoyed that. Sorry, I think you just kind of touched. No, no, I think you've just touched on on one thing there. The idea I mentioned earlier about the idea of monsters in this film. Mm. That I mean, I mean, I say I, I went to this film, into this film, having probably seen the trailer, and that was it. And so I was left with the impression that there was a monstrous presence in their house that was going to try and kill them. And that kind of isn't the film. The film's about, in many ways, who is the monster in this relationship. Mm. As I said, said, at the start, I hated the kid. I literally hated the child. I've got notes written down for me. 20 minutes in, hate the kid, want him to die. (laughs) And he is, for the the first half an hour of the film, that child is the monster. Mm. He is the monster in their lives. Yes. And slowly that shifts towards the mum being the monster. Mm. Um, And it shifts back at times. And there's very much that play of who is the monster. And I think we're about halfway through that, so we'll kind of move it a little bit more into spoiler territory. When the mum kind of does become the monster, mm. it, you always get this feeling, as you're touching the part about trauma and grief, that she's creating this. Yes, yeah. The, 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 the Babadook, the, the Babadook that, that, that exists has almost been summoned by her trauma and her dealing with it, or her lack of dealing with it. Mm. Yeah. And that their their relationship is what has summoned this character and you know I, I i would say sometimes i felt that the the allegory around that was a bit ham-fisted at times it's kind of hammered home that this is what they're talking about this mm. is what it means yeah, I uh, but i do I, I would give it credit as i said at the start for having the interesting idea around that this isn't you know a haunting it isn't that someone died 20 years ago it isn't a cursed something or other mm. but the idea being that actually this is something they've made for themselves and something they've got to deal with for themselves. Yeah, I think this goes back to this idea of that you touched on earlier of it being this psychological drama rather than necessarily a horror. That you can one one of the scary things about this film, one of the affecting things about this film, I think, is that you can see it happening to you. Like, there's mm. no way you know, like you know, you know, monsters don't exist. You know. Scream is not going to happen, or if it does, well, Scream involve, involves a human presence. But you know, a horror film is is not going to involve a bogeyman of any sort. But what can mm. really happen is that you can be psychologically psychologically affected in the way that she is in this film. Exactly, I think there is a more element of better people who've been through loss and trauma. Whereas you can see elements of of yourself in that. And I think mm. that there is. Despite my my damning review at the start of the podcast, I think there's something in that. And the ending, which I won't go into too much detail in for people who haven't seen the film, but I thought the in- ending was very interesting mm. and very, I suppose, unique. Um, outside of one other film that I can think of, I can't think of an ending in a similar manner mm-hmm. where the. The the, the the denouement of the um of the bad guy and and, and the step back to the bad guy is handled in the same way. Yes, I was. That that was another thing I liked about this was that the the moment of catharsis where you think things have been resolved is not. And no, I'm trying to tread around this, but it it it's. It, it doesn't take the easy way out in saying, well, like you said, we're gonna, we've hammered home this allegory, we're going to tie it all up in a nice neat bow and nothing's going to affect Sam and Amelia from now mm. on. There was there was a lingering presence there, which I enjoyed. 
Yeah, I think, I think that's where it almost gets the almost the allegory right. Mm. In, and that's what, why it does to work is that if they are pitching and just to kind of put it out on the table, the idea that the Babadook is, is her grief and her trauma manifest, that the ending of that of that story isn't a neat bow because the ending of trauma and grief is never a neat bow. Exactly, yeah. And and, and I think that's that was well done and like there, there was a, a wry smile at the end certainly like, oh yeah no that's that's handled well mm. and that's interesting yeah um rather than you know some sort of seance or some sort of you know sitting fire to some some bones or something some, like traditional kind of horror tropes yes i have i got a note fairly early on here so it must be early on in the film that the monster i thought the monster was something to do with the trauma of losing a father or losing a husband so it's not like there's any any great surprise in this film about the way it plays out, but the way it deals with it at the end, I think, is is really interesting. I suppose, like, say, despite my damning review, there are some interesting things to it, and it had some interesting ideas. And I do like that in the modern horror films, particularly things like It Follows, as well as I mentioned earlier, that whilst they may not be the best made films or the scariest made films, they are doing interesting things with the genre. Mm. They are doing interesting things with with these tropes that we all know. Mm. Um, but I, I say, I, I, for me, it still fell down. In fact, I just didn't like any of the characters. Okay. Apart from the neighbour. I like the neighbour. She was lovely. <laughs> she wasn't in there that much. But yeah, I agree with you. No, no, but... Yeah. And, and the dog. The dog was quite cool. The dog? Well, everyone likes the dog. Well, yeah, true. Right then, Rob, so recommendation this week. You're about to tell us what we should be watching instead. Yes, so I've got two recommendations mm-hmm. um, both in the horror genre both kind of different films in the horror genre the first up is the 2001 film The Others starring Nicole Kidman and Chris Eccleston and essentially it is a period piece who of of a woman uh, played by Nicole Kidman who had two children who have photos, photosensitivity so they have to live inside in the darkness at all times and it's a big drafty house with a load of old closed up rooms and slowly they come to the realisation that something or someone is haunting them. I don't want to go any more overly because with all horror films like the twists and the turns are, are the interesting bit. Mm-hmm. But it was well done, it was well acted, beautifully shot and occasionally having seen all the horror films that I've seen, one comes at you from left field and you don't see the real story coming and this one did it, it and to this I, I saw it when it came out which was now what, 14 years ago and to this day it stands like my mind is like that was a great cinema experience because mm. it just took me on a ride and it blew me away mm. it is scary as hell but it is also smart Brilliant. and it's the Kidman the Kidman is always good mm. my second recommendation is the 2012 film The Cabin in the Woods written by Drew Goddard uh, who's written a lot of things recently. Uh, directed by Joss Whedon of, of Buffy and the Avengers fame. Tells the story of four kids who end up in a cabin in the woods and their adventures therein. This is a film where even the any more than that as a synopsis will give away several twists and turns and, and stories within the horror film. But it is one of the best horror films that I've seen in a long time. It is one of the smartest Mm-hmm. it is scary and it is funny without being too much in the direction and if anyone wants to see what I think of as a, a great modern intelligent horror film Cabin in the Woods is one to see and it's Joss Whedon and it's Joss Whedon yeah. and it's Chris Hemsworth oh great and it's Bradley Whitford who's a person of everyone good yeah. so my recommendations for this week um, well, they're rather further back in time than yours. Um, the most recent of them is, well, it's, it's not really a horror film at all. It, it's, I suppose it goes back to this idea of being a psychological drama. And that's, this was what, why, it, why this film reminded me of it. Um, is the 1971 Clint Eastwood film Play Misty for me. Which starts mm-hmm. in a really innocuous way with, as the title suggests, someone um, requesting a song on the radio. 
So it's it's a fan writing into a DJ saying, won't you play the song Misty for me on your radio station? Um, mm. And it starts there and it gets more intense. And it is, I think, the only film I've stopped watching because it scared me so much. Um, and I wasn't that young when I saw it. So anyway, it's a great film. It's um, Clint Eastwood and Jessica Walker... Waller, don't remember her name. Jessica, somebody. Um, okay. But is Clint Eastwood being, well, not at all to type? Um, it's a very interesting film. Mm. Um, and then my second recommendation goes even further back. Um, and it was something that was brought to mind by um, a sequence, well, several sequences in the Babadook where um, Amelia flicks between channels on the TV, um, which actually reminded me of the apartment when he does that and sits in his apartment and flicks through TV channels. Um, but the films that she watches um, are very different. Um, I, th- I suppose the only comparison is that what gets watched on the screen sort of permeates what happens in the film. Um, mm-hmm. And Jennifer Kent has come out and said how affected she was by certain films. And there's actually there's a there's an article, it's not on BuzzFeed, but it's something like that on um, films that have affected Jennifer Kemp and and got her into filmmaking. And she was, I think this is her first film, but she's she's been an actor before then. Um, so my my. The second recommendation is a group of films that sort of inspired her, and you see bits of in, in these sequences where Amelia's flicking channels. Um, there's mm. one called The Witch House. It's a series, of, it's a Segundo de Chamon short, um, and then a, a series of shorts by a director called Georges Melier. And all these things are silent films from uh, before 1910. Um, I've watched some of them okay. on on YouTube, and they are. It's just it's really fun. It's they're brilliant examples of people, and it's I suppose it goes back to what you're saying about horror films that people are just playing around with cinema and seeing mm. what a genre can do, seeing in this case what moving pictures can do. So. It, it kind of it was something that that spoke to me about about Jedra Kent and the Babadook that she wanted to have that feel to what she was doing. She was seeing what she could do with the genre in the same way that these guys had done over hundred years ago. Anyway, they're not that long. Mm. They're shorts on YouTube. Go check them out. No, oh, excellent. We'll post those links up in the, in the notes. So next week, now, as always, we know we pick films for each week and we never know each other in advance what the person's going to pick mm-hmm. and it, it is Halloween month it is it is uh, October um, and so I'm taking Sam into a bit of a rabbit hole this week I'm taking Sam into into my world shall we say I so next week we're I going thought to watch... the Babadook was horror enough for you I thought it was oh, no. <laughs> yeah, next week we're going to watch the 1979 Lucio Fulci film Zombie you have made up so many of those words. I've no idea what you're saying. <laughs> uh, zombie, originally released Zombie 2, was an unofficial sequel to Dawn, uh, Night of the Living Dead, made in the Italian sort of horror genre. Ah, uh, now I'm it interested. Is... Yes. And it's good. Brilliant. It's called Zombie. We will talk about it. It is a very different film to Babook. Um, and I'm intrigued to see what Sam thinks of it. Brilliant. So that's this week. This week. If you guys want to find us online, you can find us at Twitter. We are Prestige Podcast. You can find just me at life underscore academic. Or you can find just me at Rob Kaiju. Brilliant. And we look forward to carrying on Horror Month next week. Excellent, guys. We'll see you then. Bye. The Prestige is a Kaiju Industries production. Check out their other work at facebook.com forward slash Kaiju Industries. Rawr! Arg.